attorney, so um, when it does come back, I'll let everybody know and you guys can sneak out and go grab a beer and come back in and that sort of stuff. Um, so welcome to Global Portland. Uh, this is the first meeting of 2000, or 2010. Uh, it's good to see everybody here and I see a lot of new faces, so we'll try to go through our intro stuff pretty quickly. Um, normal presentation structure or normal meeting structure. Uh, we'll talk, um, do some networking, have some introductions, although we may end up skipping it tonight because we have so many people. Um, talk about some upcoming events and then move on from there. Um, just briefly about Mobile Portland. Uh, we started uh, two years ago come March, so we we're almost at our two year anniversary. Um, we meet and talk about mobile, a variety of topics. Sometimes they're technical, sometimes they're marketing, sometimes just all over the board. Um, it's based on a concept called Mobile Mondays, which is an international event. Um, unfortunately, when we started the group, um, we couldn't get in touch with the Mobile Monday people, so we decided, and the beer has arrived. Um, so everybody, please thank uh, Liza and Amy. Um, our website, mobileportland.com. Oh, what I was going to say is that the Mobile Monday folks just want to get back to us, so we decided to move forward and grab mobileportland.com, and that's where all that information is. If you want to communicate in between meetings, um, either sign up for the mailing list where you can get announcements, or sign up for the Google group where people collaborate and talk about the different issues that they're running into related to mobile technology, um, mobile development, mobile business, that sort of stuff. Um, this is where we would normally have you introduce yourselves, but we've got so many people tonight that we're skipping that. Um, but please uh, say hello to your neighbor before you go. Um, and if I haven't had a chance to meet you, um, I'm Jason, and I would love to talk to you. Um, some upcoming events. Um, we've got the Portland iPhone Developers Group, which I don't know when they meet because they keep changing their dates, and I'm not even sure if they're still meeting. Does anyone know? Yes. Yes? <laughs> With the organizer in the back of the room, like to pick a date? Or is there a date? Are you the organizer? Yeah, how about next Tuesday? Next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> no. So they are meeting next Tuesday. Is there a place and a time? 6.30. 6.30. No, let's take a 6. 6. Okay, it's going to be 6. And... Green Dragon. Yeah, Green Dragon. Green Dragon. All right. Uh, there's the Android group. Uh, Don P. Don P. I know he's here. Don organizes the Android group, and they actually meet at the same time at the same place every month. Um, I hope you can learn from that. Which one? Uh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Uh, so they meet on the second Monday of every month at um, Lucky Lab. And uh, there's a new group, which is actually Mobile Monday PDX, um, February 8th, Backspace. Um, so, let's see there. Uh, a couple other events, big things coming up. Mobile World Congress, which is the major mobile event going on in Barcelona. Um, if you don't already have your tickets and fly there and aren't paying the five grand or eight grand to get there, to get in, then you're probably not going. But you'll see a lot of news out of that event. Um, CTIA, which is probably the largest mobile conference in the United States, is happening in March. Um, and then more locally, we've got InnoTech um, coming up, which is supposed to have a mobile track. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually happening. And Web Visions um, in May. And I just saw um, today that they announced their schedule. And there's a couple of workshops on doing iPhone development, if people are interested in that sort of stuff. Um, Raven Zachary and James Keller from Small Society are going to lead session flying um, iPhone development and <coughs> workshop on iPhone development on this conference. Very good conference. Um, you may have noticed that we don't have the little roses anymore that you guys have seen before. So we're working on an update to uh, Mobile Portland, um, which we thought we would have for today but don't actually have. So you'll see mobileportland.com get a refresh very soon. And in addition, um, we're setting it up so that people can submit the applications that they're working on. Um, submit profiles about, you know, if you're an individual who's doing mobile work, submit profiles about what you're doing. If your company, submit information about what you're doing that's mobile related. Um, so that information will, I don't know, it's going to be the next week or two to 
sort of left up all those pieces. Um, but we're really excited. It's um, last year, Rick Tarosi with the Silicon Forest wrote a blog post that was um, like 40 different iPhone apps that had been built in the Portland area, and that was pretty early on. So, and some of them are really big names, things from Starbucks to eBay to the, um, you know, the Zipcar app, those sorts of things. So, um, we're really looking forward to having a place where we can see all the different companies that are doing mobile development, um, whether it's mobile development or doing, um, you know, uh, services related to mobile or uh, products related to mobile that aren't necessarily applications. We're going to try to set it up so that, so that all that sorts of, all those content could be there. Um, so that's that's coming. Please uh, participate, and we'll probably be looking for people that help maintain that information, volunteers to moderate submissions, keep the spammers out, those sorts of things. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. Um, okay. So housekeeping out of the way. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to talk for just one moment about why augmented reality is a really interesting topic from a mobile perspective, and I'm not just talking about the fact that it's incredibly cool and it's something that we've never seen before. But I want to talk about how it relates to um, to mobile as being a mass media that's different and distinct than the previous mass media. So um, Tommy Ahonen, who uh, used to work at Nokia, is now a consultant, um, one of the best bloggers writing about mobile right now. He talks about mobile as being the seventh mass media, the first mass media being the printing press, then you've got um, recordings, you've got the cinema, you've got radio, television, internet, um, and in the same way in which, uh, you know, that uh, that peanut butter and chocolate goes together, apparently internet and tacos, <laughs> same sort of thing, it goes great together. And then you've got mobile as a seventh mass media. Now what's interesting about each of these is that each one can do this the things that the previous media was able to do. So television could show movies like the cinema, it could relay music in the same way in which you know you could from radio. But there's something that was unique about it that couldn't be done with the previous one. So um, there's a bunch of things that that um, Tommy and other people have tried to identify that are unique abilities or unique characteristics of mobile. Um, and at this point it's eight. And the newest one that they added to the list was actually augmented reality. Um, and that's what's really interesting about it. This is something that, from all the different pieces of technology that we've had before in the different medias, there was no way to accomplish this. You're not going to walk down the street holding your laptop up and trying to accomplish it. And even if you could, it wouldn't really work because the camera's on the front. And it's not, it's not meant to be mobile in the same way. Um, you have, so, uh, cameras on your window at home so you look out the side and who else is looking out their window? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, well, depending on the context, it would be useful. Give me a photo. Go on. Uh, yes. So, augmented reality uh, is very useful and also disconnects you from real reality. Um, so. With that, um, sort of been looking for a topic that would be great for mobile Portland. It's great that we have so many people in the Portland area who are actually working on augment, or augmented reality. There's actually a, uh, apparently a group that's been meeting and talking about augmented reality on a regular basis. And we've got um, Spot Matrix with or Spot Metrics with Mark um, and their library 3D AR, um, which helps people build augmented reality applications. And um, Tim. Sears, who wrote Robot Vision, which is one of the early, I was looking today, and it looks like um, the augmented reality apps were released on the 27th, and Robot Vision was written up on Redirect Web on the 28th of August, so um, pretty early on in terms of being able to do augmented reality on the iPhone. So um, with that, I want to welcome Tim and have Tim come up and lead us on. So everybody welcome Tim. Uh, and I'm a software engineer. Uh, I work for a uh, PR firm up the, up the road here called uh, Wagner Edstrom. Um, and that's my day job. My night job now is actually doing uh, iPhone development specifically for augmented reality. Um, and as Jason mentioned, um, I was one of the first uh, to really get into the mobile AR game and get something on the App Store. And 
kind of turned it into a little bit of a side business and I've really taken it now uh, innovating with user experience um, and uh, additional features on over to doing work with uh, clients. So uh, a little bit about my story. Um, Robot Vision was actually my first iPhone app. Um, and I have a, a background in Microsoft technology, so there was quite a learning curve for me uh, coming up to speed learning. Um, well, first of all, uh, I haven't even had a Mac for very long. Um, so learning you know, the Mac and what that has to offer, learning uh, you know, the iPhone platform, and then more specifically, learning how to do augmented reality applications. So um, you know, in August, there was the iPhone uh, dev camp uh, down in Silicon Valley. And uh, these guys got together and decided that in three days they were going to create an open source library that did augmented reality. And they succeeded and they won the whole open source competition. So they released this as a, as a platform that you could use for whatever you wanted to for develop. You could, um, you could commercialize it. Um, and as soon as I saw that hit the press and it, and it, and it was made available, I jumped on it right away because it was the, uh, you know, the most exciting opportunity that I'd seen in a long time to really get started doing stuff with the iPhone. So um, I got to work right away and started learning about what was missing from their framework and adding additional features to that. So one thing that they didn't have uh, initially in it was uh, you know, the use of the GPS, which is you know, required for location-based augmented reality because it needs to know where you are. Um, a data connection in most cases because you need to go out there and get data so that you can overlay that information on top of the camera. Um, the camera overlay, which actually was kind of uh, interesting because uh, at that time, Apple didn't support using, um, you know, their native iPhone library as a way to overlay uh, information on top of the, the camera that you had to use private APIs that Apple didn't support, which, you know, they would reject if you submit it through the App Store submission process. Um, the accelerometer, in order to, you know, bring up additional features like being able to look down and get a, a top-down map view using the map kit, and then a, a digital compass so that you can keep track of where your heading is and being able to display um, you know, information relative to the direction that you're facing. So again, because it has the digital, because it requires a digital compass for location-based augmented reality, it only works on the iPhone 3GS. Um, and because in order to get it to the App Store using supported libraries, um, I had to wait for OS 3.1 to be released, which uh, happened in early September. So uh, a month of just about every single night and weekend of free time that I had, and I had something ready to go. Um, so. As I mentioned, it's based on the iPhone AR kit. Um, what's involved with Robot Vision? Well, I grabbed as many openly available uh, uh, data sources that are location-based that I thought would be interesting that I could also, uh, you know, from a legal perspective, commercialize on. So I used Bing uh, Local Search. Um, I really liked what they did in terms of aggregating reviews. Um, they've got some cool, uh, you know, semantic aggregation there that you can link out to. Um, Twitter, obviously, at the time, they didn't have the geolocation API available, but you were able to specify your longitude, latitude coordinates in your location. Um, Flickr, because you can geotag photos when you upload them to Flickr, and then uh, Wikipedia, which came in a later release, um, as there are uh, you know, some libraries available where you can get geotagged Wikipedia content. So, really, at the core of it, if you have something to work with, like if you have the iPhone uh, AR kit, which is open source, or Spot Metrics, who are going to be up here talking a little bit about their library. Really, all you need is data sources with latitude and longitude coordinates, and from there, it's all user experience and making it work the way, and the experience work the way that you want to do to filter your users. So I really saw the opportunity with Robot Vision as a gateway to bring you into richer metadata. To be able to show that initial point of information, like that pizza place is a floating tag over there, you can tap on it and get all this additional contextual information about that location. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Spot Metrics as a platform offload a lot of the heavy lifting. So I'm focusing on all of this client work now. I'm um, looking to be working with Spot Metrics in the near future to start leveraging them because they're going to continue to innovate on the platform level and add new features where I don't have time to continue to build up, um, you know, the stuff that I put together uh, so that I can extend that stuff off to my clients to make uh, more robust augmented reality experiences for them. Um, as I mentioned, location-based AR is accessible. If you're doing iPhone development right now, chances are it's probably pretty easy for you to jump in and start doing location-based augmented reality. Um, everything is all based around UI views, and now I hear they've got some OpenGL incorporated, which is pretty sweet. Looking forward to playing with that. Um, really easy to plug in additional data visualizations, as I mentioned. And I look at it from a, a 
conceptual point of view, if any of you have ever used the 320 framework that uh, you know, that guy from Facebook put together to be able to you know, extend and use their uh, image libraries, be able to do a lot of that pinching and swiping stuff with the image galleries, I kind of look at it as that. It's like taking a lot of the, the stuff that you don't really want to have to worry about, that you know you're going to be able to reuse a lot, and being able to build on top of it to make a greater experience. Um, as for AR in general, I look at it as a new way of exploring user interface. So in many ways, it can supplement a lot of geolocation apps that you already have. You've got, already got the list view in a lot of apps. You've already got the map kit available. Now you can add augmented reality using those same data sources and provide an additional way to, to view the data that you're presenting to your user. Uh, location AR on mobile devices has limitations. One of the biggest of these is the GPS accuracy because when you first turn on your iPhone and it goes out there to get the GPS signal, it does this quick ping, right? So it comes back and sometimes it'll say that I'm standing in here talking to you guys, I might actually be out there on the freeway according to what the GPS says. After you've had it open for a while and it locks onto the signal, it actually refines that and makes it more accurate. So in some cases with really short range, you know, I might be standing outside of the building here looking up at the About Us office with my iPhone and it might actually think that it's behind me. So that is one limitation, and, and uh, I think as we see our hardware improvements on mobile devices in the coming years, um, you know, this will get better. Uh, digital compass is obviously a factor as well. If the compass is not getting the right heading, then it's not going to put the object in the right direction. So sometimes there could be interference, like when I'm standing too close to my laptop or a variety of other computers. Things that are emitting a magnetic signal, then those are going to interfere with the digital um, data accuracy is a factor as well, so a lot of the broader geolocation data sources like Bing Local, Google Local, sometimes their data sources are right on and they've got the pin plotted right in the middle of the building. Sometimes they're not and it's at the nearest cross street, so that can be a factor as well. And then there's the whole social awkwardness thing. Um, Sometimes I would be testing my app as I was building it and sitting in a restaurant and looking around and I'd be like looking at you and you'd look at me like, why the hell are you taking a picture of me? You know, there's that social awkwardness factor that I think that as augmented reality becomes more mainstream, people will come to accept it, but for now, uh, you're just going to have to deal with the fact that they're not taking pictures of you, I guess. Um, so I saw a lot of, uh, a lot of publicity and, and success from Robot Vision on the App Store. I did get featured by Apple, so that's a screenshot of that there, and that's like the, the awesomest moment of my career, I have to say, getting featured by Apple on the App Store. Um, but the, the market for location-based AR apps alone is becoming very saturated. If you do a search on the App Store for augmented reality, and most of the apps on the App Store right now are location-based AR, there's a whole bunch of them. So really, uh, the, the available opportunity to continue to work on AR for businesses to do something really innovative that nobody's ever seen before. Or, uh, in my case, this is the route that I took, was uh, building a business around doing white labeling for clients and helping them um, you know, increase their brand visibility or get location-based AR into their apps. Um, so one example of this is a, a client that I recently finished development for, uh, for an app called Find an Apartment. It was a very early app that uh, apparently was featured in uh, one of the uh, Apple TV ads. But they really were looking to take, um, you know, the, the experience of having the list view and the map view and being able to supplement that with an augmented reality integration. So this is not available yet um, on the App Store, and I actually just got the permission to talk about it today, so it's pretty sweet. Um, but basically, it's a similar experience to what Robot Vision offers, but with apartments nearby as your data sources, and when you touch on those locations, it brings up more information about those apartments, and you can tap on the blue contextual icon there to get even more information about those locations. So AR is quickly becoming an industry. Um, there was... Uh, a conference actually announced, I think it was last week, called the Augmented Reality Event. Um, I believe it's going to be in Silicon Valley. And uh, they've got uh, uh, Bruce Sterling, who's going to be doing the main keynote. He's a famous science fiction author, um, well respected in the augmented reality community, and uh, you know a variety of other speakers who were going to be talking and doing workshops for development from a marketing perspective, from a business perspective. Um, so it's quickly becoming an industry, and this year, according to uh, analysts from Juniper Research, it's going to be a $2 million industry. They're projecting $700 million by 2014. I don't think all of that is going to be just location-based AR, because there's a lot of different flavors of AR that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. 
But right now, the majority of the augmented reality applications, aside from the location-based stuff we're seeing on the App Store, is really all about brands. So I'm sure a lot of you saw uh, the Esquire uh, cover a couple of months ago um, that was an augmented reality cover. And you could actually hold up the magazine in front of your webcam, and there would be these superimposed floating 3D objects around. Um, a lot of people call these kind of gimmicky because they don't really serve a business purpose right now. They're really kind of looking to, to build a brand. They're still really cool and fun to play with, but really a lot of the stuff we're seeing for companies like Adidas and Lego, um, Across Air, which is a company doing uh, location-based AR, uh, did a, an app for Stella Arta to help you find you know bars in the area that, that serve their beer, which is pretty cool. But really I think in order for uh, AR to take off and hit the masses, we're going to need a killer app that solves it. Um, this is a screenshot of my dedicated uh, app screen for augmented reality apps on my iPhone. Most of these are free or very cheap. I don't think I've paid more than $2 for any of these location-based AR apps. Um, but there are some definitely some recognized industry leaders at this point. Um, Layer and Wikitude are some of the big names. Um, although, unfortunately, Layer has had a little bit of a setback in terms of iPhone at this point and have had to remove their app to fix some crashing issues. Um, so definitely go and check some of these out. Again, most of them are free and, and are, are fun to play with. Um, there are a lot of other flavors of AR and as these become more widely available for mobile platforms, um, I think that will increase the opportunity for innovation and, and for more people to get a slice of that pie. So one of the big popular ones right now is this marker-based object tracking. You can see the screenshot of the guy here holding the Coke bottle with the avatar logo on it and he's able, if you've seen the ad, he's able to move his bottle around and it moves the, uh, the avatar gunship around um, you know, in, on his monitor in this virtual word, world. So the idea behind these is that you have a webcam on your monitor and you're holding up a marker that the webcam is able to recognize and then it superimposes a 3D object on top of your monitor in three dimensional space. So as you're moving around the marker, it looks like there's this real world 3D object floating around with it. And it looks really, really cool. Um, one very practical application of this is uh, by a company called Zugara, uh, who created a virtual shopping application. So you're able to stand in front of the webcam on your uh, laptop, and it superimposes uh, clothing on top of you, so that you can have this kind of virtual shopping experience, so you know just how crazy that pink sweater is going to look on you before you actually buy it and wear, wear it out the door. Um, Late last year, John Mayer uh, became the first person to ever create uh, a augmented reality music video using a similar tracking technique. So you could hold up a marker and it would superimpose this music video in real time with him playing. It was like he was right there on your desk playing his music video. Um, I already talked about the Avatar Coca-Cola thing. One of the big limitations to why we aren't seeing these on mobile yet is because Apple, uh, at least for iPhone, Apple doesn't allow us to capture uh, real-time video using a supported library um, and, and that's using this UI get screen image library so you can do it using an unsupported library and make conceptual apps and that's why you see some of them out there on YouTube but at, at this point they're not supporting that yet for um, use in the App Store uh, with a couple of exceptions there's a company called Occipital how many of you have the red laser app on your iPhone they made the red laser app very widely uh, publicized and successful. I think they made over a million bucks at this point. They have an SDK on their site that allows you to incorporate the red laser uh, barcode scanning app into your own applications, right? And it really just scans the app and takes the actual numeric value of that barcode and then you're free to do whatever you want with it. You can go out and call you know, Amazon's product search API or the Google uh, products API. Um, and what's interesting about this is that behind the scenes, they're using this same UI get screen image library, and Apple is approving these apps, but at this point, we're not seeing them in reality apps. So to me, and I'm not really, uh, I haven't worked too much with the object recognition stuff, um, but it really, I think, uh, could create an opportunity for somebody that wants to go in there and give a shot and see if Apple will approve it, because they are approving these barcode scanning apps. Um, if you're interested in the red laser, uh, SDK, uh, they do take 10% of your sales on top of the 30% that Apple already takes at a $2,500 minimum. So it's um, has a little bit of an entry if you're, you really need to be serious about it, basically. 
Um, and this kind of falls under the Internet of Things flavor of AR, right? Where it's not always so visual necessarily, but you're still interacting with these objects in the real world that are providing additional contextual information. And one of those that's really popular in Japan is QR codes. Apparently they have them everywhere, and the idea is you use the camera on your phone, and you either snap a photo with the QR code or, or it scans it in real time with the video feed. And um, you can embed various information in these codes, like uh, text or URLs or phone numbers. Um, and uh, Google recently started jumping on this and sent out 100,000 QR codes to uh, businesses from within Google Local with the hopes that they could take those QR codes and put them on their window. Um, hopefully it happens because it would be awesome to see QR codes get really widely adopted in the United States, but I think we could probably all agree that most people that aren't familiar with this technology would look at it and say, what the hell is this weird thing? Why do I want to put it on my window? Uh, Microsoft is also doing something similar to QR codes. It's called Microsoft Tag. Uh, what's interesting and differentiates this from QR codes is that Microsoft Tag, you can actually change the values of after you've printed them. So if you realize that uh, you've printed a value for some URL A and you need to change that URL to URL B, you can change it even after you've printed 100,000 and then it's sent them to a whole bunch of companies. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, there is an open source QR code reader called Z ZXing, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, it was originally written in Java, but there is an iPhone port for it, there's an Android port as well. Um, so if you're interested in doing stuff with QR code, definitely check that out. Uh, object recognition. Uh, hopefully everybody's heard of Google Goggles by now. I just like saying Google Goggles because it sounds really funny. Uh, if you're not familiar with Google Goggles, the idea is, is you take, uh, and it's only on Android, you take uh, the application, you take a photo of something relatively recognizable, say for example a cereal box, and it does this really cool scanning animation of where it's like scanning this laser across the image, right? And then it sends it out to their server and comes back with Google search results about that product. Uh, it works with logos um, and very identifiable, recognizable objects, barcodes, it probably does QR codes too. It's been really, really cool. Uh, Tim, Tim O'Reilly was talking about the fact that the stuff that they haven't released yet, like somebody takes a photo of him and it comes back and says Tim O'Reilly and provides his details. That's amazing. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it will recognize you. Probably, probably famous humans, though, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are people who have photos online, or whatever they seem to be. Oh. Yeah. What's interesting about it is it's actually not in real time yet, so it does take some time for it to actually scan the image and bring results back. But I think it's only a matter of time before Google or somebody else is going to be able to take a real-time video feed and actually superimpose data on top of it you know, within a second or less. So that's really, really exciting technology. and. and they're the first to really do it on a widespread level yet. Um, another thing that you can actually start doing stuff with now uh, is uh, this company called Musix makes these crazy robot goggles. I think the more appropriate term is a uh, head-mounted display. But the idea is, is they're kind of like sunglasses. I know I look like I'm on Star Trek right now. But um, there are uh, screens inside of these, right? And you can take this, and, the, and there's a little iPhone connector here, so you can connect it right into your iPhone. And, uh, and on my app, I'm using a, an unsupported library to do this so it doesn't work on the App Store, but I can actually pipe the video feed from my augmented reality app into these glasses, and so then while it's plugged in, I can look around and actually see the experience. And It's a little awkward because I have to still have to touch on stuff while I'm doing it, but uh, it's really, really quite a cool concept. So um, they have other uh, glasses like this as well that actually have compasses built into them. Um, but it's only a matter of time, I think, before these become standalone devices and maybe we won't even be using phones anymore. Maybe we'll have, um, you know, just sunglasses or potentially contact lenses, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. <laughs> uh, tablets. Everybody been following the tablet rumors? Everybody sick of the tablet rumors? <laughs> It's really exciting, I think, because the tablet is not just going to be about saving media and saving publishing, but depending on what kind of hardware is inside of it, if there's a rear-facing camera, if there's a front-facing camera, it, it opens and closes different doors for these different flavors of augmented reality. So if you have a front-facing camera, you can use a tablet to superimpose Optimus Prime onto your body. If you have a rear-facing camera, you can do location-based AR. So there's really 
going to be some kind of an opportunity for augmented reality, depending on what we see on lens stage from Apple with this tablet. And then other tablet devices coming out from other manufacturers might open other doors for augmented reality as well. Uh, wicked awesome sunglasses. So Nokia did a concept uh, video uh, a couple months ago. They're basically like regular sunglasses that are transparent. Um, the technology doesn't exist as far as we know yet. It's all conceptual. The idea is that it's coming, but that you look around and it recognizes your eye movements. And I'm assuming, you know, when you flex your eye, it would act as a selector. But you could navigate menus superimposed on top of these glasses to be able to, uh, you know, listen to music or communicate with people using really simplistic like emoticons. Um, so the concept is really, really cool. Uh, probably at least five years away, maybe ten. Uh, and then lastly is contact lenses, which is really the almost kind of borderline scary, but really, really cool. Uh, being able to have contact lenses that you wear in your eyes that uh, you know, are digitally connected, potentially with an internet connection, that can superimpose digital information on top of your eyes. And uh, researchers at the University of Washington currently have some kind of a prototype working. Um, there's an article out there, I can't remember where it was from, but they're, they're, they're describing their research in that area. So uh, eventually we will have contact lenses in our eyes to be able to, to interact with the world around us. Um, so just lastly, I want to close with a couple of fun videos that um, uh, I realize these links are not friendly. But uh, to go check out if you're really interested in this space. Um, Bruce Sterling, uh, the science fiction writer I was talking about earlier, did a uh, keynote at a, a layer conference last summer, basically kicking off the whole augmented reality industry and talking about the things that we need to pay attention to from an ethical perspective, from a technological perspective, things that we, the things that are going to be coming later. Um, the Nokia World uh, example I was just talking about with the, the cool Nokia sunglasses. And then uh, TAT Augmented ID, uh, which is a concept video. Um, it's often mistaken as an actual app, but the idea with that in their concept video is that you actually look at a person, similar to what you were describing earlier, and it superimposes a floating tag for their Flickr account, for their Twitter account. So being able to use um, uh, you know, human identification for, uh, to be able to uh, network or understand more about the people that are around you. So. <coughs> So that's it. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, if you want to check out Robot Vision, my website is robotvision-ar.com. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, YouTube Awan, if you're into the Twitter thing. Thanks, guys. Presentation. Um, it's in terms of really a good summary of everything that's happening right now and, and, and some history on it. Uh, this technology is um, about 19 years old. I'm Mark Anderson. Um, I work with Josh Aller uh, at Spot Metrics. I'm an independent iPhone and Rails developer and uh, I did web development all my career until iPhone. I got a hot tip to build a, a bubble blowing application, and uh, it um, <laughs> it turned out to be I basically I built it at RailsConf. That's how I learned to do um, iPhone development. I really enjoyed animation and uh, graphics programming, and um, it turned out to be pretty good in terms of uh, generating some exposure. And there's just so much demand for iPhone application development and mobile development. Um, that it seems like if you can uh, if you can prove that you can at least get your an idea turned into something that is a quality product, you're going to be able to service somebody's need. Everybody has ideas for for uh, applications. But especially with augmented reality, because people want to see new things. This is this is new. This is why I think it's exciting. I think um, it really is new. There's been a bit of a wall, and we've seen we've seen everything. Um, has have most people seen the movie Avatar? Um, there are some technologies in Avatar that look really cool that are either already in existence or 
you can see prototypes. Actually, here in Portland, there, there are companies doing some of that stuff. Um, for example, the one where you've got the screen with a, a file open on it. The guy comes up with a see-through tablet, goes like this, and the file goes over onto the tablet. That's done. That's, that's not QGIS right now. Um, here are two sort of different definitions. The bottom one has to do with really the overlay of graphics. Um, I think that the first one's a little more general. Okay. So that's why augmented reality is important. It's new, it's very relevant to so many things right now. It's not, it's not just a whiz bang cool thing. If you remember virtual reality, uh, in, in the 90s, I mean, it was, it was cool. Um, Max Headroom was pretty cool. <laughs> but it's, 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 um, it's gimmicky. It's really gimmicky. A lot of augmented reality stuff is gimmicky. It's just pure. You see it and it's like, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I like it, but that's not what I'm going to do anything with. I'm not motivated to do anything with, with a lot of the stuff that you see. But with mobile augmented reality and geospatial stuff and mixing in API data from APIs all over the place, now you're actually solving problems. You're, uh, it, it's like RSS, you know? Everybody always said that RSS was really going to be a technology that people use when you don't mention RSS anymore. And that's where we're, it's just like, um, it's data and it comes to me. Augmented reality, uh, it's just visualization of, of uh, information. And the information can come from a bunch of different sources. Obviously. Let's see. There are some questions that um, Tim did a pretty good job answering a lot of these lately. The target based versus the location and spatial based, that's important because the um, location and spatial based is pretty new. There's still advancements for target based though. I saw that um, Google local search QR code. I saw one in San Rafael on just some, some uh, cafe. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. I guess, I guess you just use your general QR reader and then you get a URL and then, you know, it's pretty cool. It's, it's gonna take a lot more adoption, I think. I, I like the idea of having, um, you know, Google's doing it, so there's prob it's probably gonna be woven into a bunch of other stuff. But I like the idea of having um, just so much more integration. Um, and that's why, I'll get to that in a minute, but we're, that's why we're working on something that helps developers to platform for just like the robot, I mean the uh, red laser SDK. If you're going to do something uh, that scans barcodes, you'll probably get the red laser SDK or you'll go learn about digital signal processing. And if you know about that, then that's how you should do it because their product's pretty expensive. Um, it's doable, but if a client comes to you and says, hey, I want this thing, and I need it, you know, really soon, are you going to go read a huge book on digital signal processing? Um, I, for one, just, I don't know, I, I noticed that my strengths go so far, and then stuff that's outside of that, I'm probably, I'm probably just going to talk with somebody, you know, and take like an academic interest in that stuff. Um, so Tim for, is offloading the stuff to um, 3DAR that he doesn't want to work on so that he can service the, the demands and needs of his, his clients. Um, I didn't really talk about this slide at all right then because I just want to get to the next one. Um, so we've been, we've been developing this product called 3DAR, which is a um, 3D augmented reality SDK that you can put into an iPhone app and uh, build an app in, um, we'll pass around our phones pretty soon. So you can see an app that I built in a day, it's pretty cool. It's called the Pizza Street, and it uses the Google Street View. Um, it actually kind of hacks Google Street View to get a low resolution image from right outside of wherever you are. And then it does a um, Yahoo local search for pizza, and then it shows an augmented reality view of pizza parlors from standing outside. Um, this was a view looking down that big hill right up from Castro Theater. 
There's one of those bubbles that I use from High Bubble. Um, you can't really see it, but the, there's a huge sign right here that says Castro. Uh -huh. um, we, uh, so I spent a couple weeks in San Francisco, and I wanted to know where are the good places to eat, where am I staying, got lost a lot, where did I park my car, because I park a mile away almost every time. And I got to tell you, it was actually helpful. It was more than just whiz bang cool. It was actually helpful to use this application I wrote called My Maps that connects to um, my Google Maps. And I see a list of all my maps. And anybody can just go to Google and click My Maps and make maps. You can share maps. There's a lot of stuff. Um, I just found there's a lot of disc golf courses here in, in Portland. I mean, I knew that they were there, but there were actually some that I didn't know were here because on Google Maps, people have gone and said that, you know, here they are. And some people have been diligent and actually put the tees and the baskets in there. And um, we're working on making a community of people doing that so that, I mean, that'd be a pretty sweet app, right? You go to a, a golf course and you're like, uh, where's T1? Oh, there it is. And then you go over to it and uh, you get the idea, hopefully. It's, a lot of these applications actually just kind of come to you pretty obviously. It's, um, that's another thing that's exciting about it, is that it's obvious technology. You, you can see it. Uh, I can explain to my parents that when they go to San Francisco um, and they put Castro Theater on their map and they need to walk across town to get there, they don't know where it is, but all they have to do is find it here and then go. And then just think of all the service calls that you can make along the way and Minority Report style lasers can find her and uh, offer her hats and <laughs> Here are all these QR codes. Josh has made this one, which is um, better in many ways because it can get very small, very little resolution. Um, let's see here. There are different. All right. So the computer vision aspect, I didn't know about Google being able to just. I mean, they're making they're making a robot. They're making. <laughs> They're making an Android. Um, watermarking is also very cool too. You can watermark audio, both audio and video stuff. Um, and so, like this image, you can have watermark on it. We can't see it with our eyes, which are good at some things, but not good at like seeing Fourier transform. But even even that camera can do it. So. Um, why is the mobile platform the most important platform today? I think I'll say more on the next. Oh, well, the reason why is because everybody has a cell phone now, <laughs> all across the world, and um, most phones are going to have compasses very soon. Most phones are going to have accelerometers, um, nice screens, Good batteries, good batteries. Um, so they're pervasive and they're powerful. They're basically computers. Um, you can tailor them to your specific needs, every single person. Um, which, by the way, I just jailbroke an old phone. And there's no reason not to jailbreak your phone, but of course, I, I jailbroke my old phone. Um, but I highly recommend you try doing it on your old phone um, because you see that there's like this whole world of Customizability and, and, of course, backgrounding apps is really nice. Um, that was sort of a tangent. But the idea is that you really can do so much with these things. It, um, and people understand that who are making businesses out of this. Uh, people who have existing websites understand it's just a no-brainer now. I need a mobile app. I need at least one mobile app. It, remember when it was like, uh, hey, you guys have yellow pages. Great. but. You need a website, and then finally people um, came, you know, sooner or later to understand that they needed to have a website. And it's like, oh, I might want to get a Facebook application. <laughs> now it's like, well, you really need a website, you really need to get on Facebook somehow, and you really need at least one iPhone application. Really you should have a few applications and just get them out, like ASAP. Get maybe one out that had like that you just keep developing that really represents the essential essential aspects of your business. Um, but just like buy 3DAR and make something in three days or a week or so and get it out and it promotes one specific thing. 
like Coachella. There should be a, well, there are Coachella apps, or like big music festival apps. Um, if you're not already a mobile developer, then, um, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, but there's just like, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many um, uh, opportunities for mobile development. And I really like the idea of, like what Red Laser is doing it, although I don't think we're doing it the way I would do it. Um, I like. I like the idea of licensing SDKs, and I'm sure that a lot of people in here have um, the skills to make a component that that everybody else should know about, um, and we can all learn from each other. I mean, look around. This is a great place. This actually, Portland, is one of these spots on the planet where this is happening, where mobile development is happening, but also augmented reality. There aren't that many spots, and a lot of them are in Asia and um, Northern Europe. Spot metrics has four patent filings. We made these targets, um, which you should see in the past round. They're, they're very cool. All this technology is it's immediately like, wow, cool. People want to actually do something with it. And this one especially is very helpful. We've got some product. We do custom development. Um, all right, three dark. Some of the images that we have over here are, uh, they just came out of the development. Um, a lot of them were bugs. It's just like, wow, that's really cool. I was driving around, and it's illegal now, but I was driving around looking at the uh, pizza street, and I, it's really, it's weird, because um, there's like, it's a 3D world, what it is. It's just like, like Second Life, basically, except for it's centered on you, and um, then you can augment the, the your world with a bunch of geodata, but also um, fixtures, which can be just stuff that's there. I was driving, and my sphere that I was in, where I started, which had my Google Street View, was here. And now I'm driving, and I think I made it like a kilometer wide. Oh yeah, so, so it's a 3D world, but it's actually overlaid onto our rear, real world. Um, so I was driving and looking at stuff around. And, um, and I can see like all the pizza places moving kind of like behind me. And then I, I look and I, I see like this hole in, in the universe. Uh, <laughs> and as I moved, I, it just became this sphere kind of going behind me. And it's kind of an experience that you, you just have to have. I can imagine with, 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 the, with goggles it would be uh, even more immersive, but <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, oh yeah, if you're going to do what we do with 3R, you're going to need to make 3D coordinate system. Um, you're going to have to find a way to get those those uh, points onto a 2D screen. You're going to have to do sensor filtering, which is harder than it sounds. Point of interest data management is. To me, the fun part, that's where you connect to Facebook and Google and Yahoo and everything. Geospatial point conversion. And some of the stuff gets pretty esoteric. There's UI instrumentation, UI controls. Um, we're still in beta right now, but most apps that you've seen, augmented reality apps, have a little bird's eye view. They have, um, like, Wikitude's a really good one. It's got a, a range slider. Um, like very standard controls, you're going to have to do those. Customizable augmentations and views. That's if you want to do more than just one application. Um, we made it to where, uh, if you know, you know, the iPhone development at all, there's just UI view. We made it to where we say, okay, here is a point on a map. Give me a view. Uh, and the view can do anything. It can be two-dimensional, it can be three-dimensional, doesn't matter. There's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that's harder than um, I thought it would be, actually. Mobile devices we talked about, they're evolving with us, kind of like dogs. Um, they, uh, I sometimes get a little scared about like robots and androids and um, our devices being so smart and the singularity and like all this stuff that you can see on TED and Bruce Sterling is, is uh, worth listening to. Um, but lately I've been able to just kind of embrace it a little bit more. 
Um, for one thing, it's happening. It just it just is happening. But also, it's like you can see that it's happening um, by by pretty good people. I mean, it's people who are doing it. Um, and there's a lot of beauty that can come out of um, of this development, specifically augmented reality. Um, there's I really think there are going to be totally new paradigms for accessing information. It's not just like a, a, a gunship floating around, yay, or John Mayer. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, gimmicks. But there are non-gimmick applications. Oh, OK. Immersive Media is a company here in town who went down to KB. This is, this is not the view you're supposed to be looking at, but I just, it's so awesome. This is um, panoramic footage that they got in Haiti. And sure, this is one way to look at it, you know, pretty cool. Have you guys seen the, uh, this thing? It was on CNN, yeah, on Mashable, it's like all over the place. Look at this. So it's a video. That's pretty cool, except I can turn it. <laughs> and I'm basically a hit. I mean, did you know this is what it looked like? Did you know there's so many people mulling about? <laughs> because the, is this the flash? Yeah, this is their flash. All right, so I want to ask. Is this augmented reality? Recorded reality. This is reality. What would make this augmented reality? Is it information for location? Yeah. I mean, what if I paused it and scanned that person's face? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is an augmented reality if it's not in real time. This is a recording, right? Yes. Okay, so, so that brings up a point about how the definition of the question. Yeah. Delay. It's, delay. it's just a delay. Well, yeah, it can be augmented reality. I, personally, I, I challenge the idea that you need to have a camera to do augmented reality. It's useful for a lot of applications, but there's a lot more. It doesn't matter. Um, and I mean, just use any of the apps, and like the Yelp app. The first time I used the Yelp app, I was like, "Oh my gosh, it's so cool! Here's all these these things." But I'm in my office looking at the wall. I know that I'm looking that direction. I don't need a representation of the wall in a low-res camera. Why not put something else cool behind it? You'll see that. Piece. And Google Sky Map. Say again. Google Sky Map. Google's uh, star looking. Program. Yeah. It doesn't use a camera at all, it could, but it shows you pictures because they're pretty. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that the, uh, the sky map is what it's called? Uh, I don't know. I think there's one called Pocket yeah, Center, which is kind of my point. It finally came out much after the sky map, um, where you look around and you see constellations and stuff out there. I need a camera for that. The camera's just going to get in the way. Um, but what they did do is take like a really nice photo and put it in there with like a nice twilight, and, and you can still see the stars, and it's better. It's Better interface. Uh, oh. Buzzworthiness. Seeing it front page. Mashable. I'd like to go mashable. Um, everybody's talking about this thing. Okay. If you want to. Oh. We. The, all right. So we have. 3DAR is um, it's a library, it's a static library that you link into your iPhone applications. Uh, you can become a registered developer to get a license key for one device. Take that device, write your own applications, or go to GitHub. Um, we've got a few uh, open source projects on there right now. The My Maps, which I really want to see turn into something much bigger. There's currently, as far as I know, no Google Map editor 
in the App Store, which is strange. Um, so right now it gets your list of maps, it shows them to you, and I want to be able to add push pins and stuff. I think it would be really helpful to be able to walk around and have all your maps with you and then just look at it in augmented reality, and then um, based on the type of stuff, data that's on the map, you should be able to have um, all kinds of different views that appear there. These are open source projects um, that if you're a developer and you have a key for 3Dart, you can just like start playing with these apps right away, and that's kind of fun and all. But really, what you should do with that, if you're if you're into that, is go get clients who want apps developed because there's so many clients who want apps developed at a really good rate. Um, I'm not kidding. I made this thing on a fast run. It's not like mind blowing, but it's pretty cool, and it's basically almost ready to submit. I made this thing in a day. Uh, it's the Pizza Street thing, and it's the code is up. You can look at it. Um, and there are two other ones that we need to clean up a little bit before we put up there. Um, you can get an application license too, and it costs a little bit more, uh, and then submit your apps. And one final word, I guess. Things are pretty cool right now, Sears says, but they're definitely going to get better. That's from Tim KP article that I just came across a minute ago. And he mentioned social awkwardness. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then, I mean, this is like William Gibson stuff. <laughs> so is that a before and after picture, like glasses turn the guy to the top? <laughs> 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 iPhones have kind of a, an appeal to them, or at least they're not clunky. The top, these are still clunky, that thing, that's not clunky. Um, it's gonna take real applications though. I mean, why would somebody walk around like that? <laughs> but, but they, you know, you can do it. And also, one more thing on, uh, whether there's a camera or not. I think you can make a lot of applications that are not at all your traditional uh, augmented reality. I mean, you, you can call it augmented reality, but basically what we're talking about here is the 3D realm that has um, two-dimensional or three-dimensional views. Um, and you can get like panoramic imagery and stuff and put it in there. And there's so much data available now from from services that are in the cloud that are never going to go down, probably, and just get better. So um, there's just so many opportunities. There's just not enough time in the day. And augmented reality just makes it, there be less time in the day, which is really great. Right? So thank you very much, and go get them. <laughs>
quite a bit of time to come up to speed with you know developing for the iPhone, but you know once you know the general software engineering principles of object oriented programming, it's not too bad. Um, one thing I just kind of add on top of that, I mean, I know you mentioned that you've got a MyMaps application that allows you to plug in Google's MyMaps um, as a data source. I'm doing something similar with clients too, where we use MyMaps in order to allow them to edit and customize their own content. So you mentioned that you're you know familiar doing WordPress blogs, and if you're using a WordPress template, you know that. Um, you know, sometimes you'll use a template, and maybe there's like five or ten other people out there that use the same template as you. As long as you're okay with having a similar user experience to other people's apps and similar graphics to other people's apps, you know, theoretically, it would be really, really easy to just plug something like that into my maps and have a very similar user experience, but powered with your own geolocation data. So the short answer is one year. What's that? Yeah, the short answer is one year. Say a year. If, if you're serious about iPhone development, you'd probably pick it up in a year. You guys are um, looking at a lot of different uh, augmented reality devices. Have you seen any more advancements with headsets that do uh, uh, retina scanning? Uh, nothing that I've seen yet. I mean, the, the head mounted displays, I mean, the, the music ones that I've got there have been around for a couple of years. They just released um, a new model that looked more like traditional sunglasses at CES. Um, but at this point, other than embedding like a compass in them, um, I haven't seen anything with Redis yet. Have you seen any of that? I don't know. The hardware is there, though. Yeah, the hardware is there. It's been out for a long time. So you just have cameras, right? I mean, some of the cameras and you find your scanning with high focal stuff. Oh, wow. Is there, a, is there a platform like uh, OpenGL and uh, Chrome or something that, that is, it's, it's an evolving platform that can be more or less standardized? There is a data uh, standardization that WikiTunes has been organized from a data perspective to have kind of like an HTML of, uh, of augmented reality, they're calling it ARML. Um, I don't think it's been too widely adopted yet, but it's really, really new. But from a functional perspective, I haven't seen anything like that yet, just from a, from a data perspective. Um, a lot of people have been uh, hoping to see, you know, like potentially a centralized data source where there's all of these different, um, you know, layer calls them layers, but all these different types of data sources in a centralized location that maybe we could have multiple web, you know, multiple AR browsers, like we have web browsers today that all are able to uh, you know, connect to and download the same data just like web browsers would download HTML. Sure. Um, you may you may have had in the libraries um, and doing the actual augmented reality some fairly simple in terms of like locating getting the coordinates using the open source library. Um, like I know if you if you don't localize your app on the program initially, I don't know if you have to go back and have to localize it again. If you don't have AR built into an app, if you've got an app, you know, the local or the uh, augmented reality on that, it is really difficult to like kind of localize the app. Um, well, I'll get my perspective, and then I'm, I'm sure you've got to think on this as well. Uh, from my perspective, I built Robot Vision from the ground up as you open the camera view and everything sits on top of the camera view, right? With the Find an Apartment app that I was showing as an example, everything was built around a navigational style app, and then when you tap the button, it would bring up the modal camera and then over the information on that. I found it actually more complex to do it that way, uh, because then when you're done or you, or you want to go back into the regular app, um, to access, you know, maybe a, a generic view elsewhere in the app. You have to close that modal window, and it kind of makes a quirky experience where it shows the camera shutter um, you know, closing or moving out of the way. So if you're building something from the ground up, I definitely recommend doing it, you know, everything on top of the camera view. But it can be done. It just, from what I found, it was a little bit more difficult. So it's definitely more difficult to layer it on top. But there's a lot of applications that already have existing geodata, like take the Yelp application or Google Zoom, and then you hear it in. But yeah, it's simpler for sure to start on the foundation. So I think uh, one last question, um, and then we'll wrap up, wrap up is, um, or I guess two. We've got two last questions. And then uh, for those that are interested, um, there's probably going to be some of us headed over to Produce Row, which is a bar right across the street for some drinks afterwards. So we can discuss your speakers, maybe.
conceptualizing why you would want to have augmented reality and, and why that would be better than just a straight up simple 2D view of the data that you're trying to present um, beyond just the kind, kind of like the gimmicky aspects. I mean, it is really cool. The, 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 what makes aug augmented reality more preferable to a simple 2D view? So, um, I went to New York for the first time about three months ago, and I'd never been there before. And I downloaded one of those cool subway apps that helped you know you're on the subway. But when I got off the subway, and I was like, where's the Statue of Liberty? Because I want to go check out the Statue of Liberty. I could look down on my map view and see, OK, the Statue of Liberty is to the southwest. And I could maybe hit that compass icon that maybe works half the time that kind of points me in the right direction. Or I could get off the subway and pull out my phone and look around and appear in 60 degree view and tell us see I need to head that way. And that saved me a significant amount of time because I was able to just head that way until I actually saw the physical statue of Liberty. So that was one one case for me where it really just hit home right away, like wow, this actually is solving a problem that I couldn't have solved in the other orientation. Do you did you type you, right to, 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 just like the fundamental thing is that it puts you in that. You're you've actually experienced it whereas in 2D view kind of looking down at some data, but now you're actually in the, the world. I mean, you type in Statue of Liberty, though, how do you filter it? It makes it a bit easier. It depends on the application. In my case, I was doing something similar to what you were describing with your MyMaps application. I made my own custom New York app for the um, things that I wanted to go see. Uh, last question here. So, um, as an app developer or a library developer, uh, what platform constraints of, of, the, very, of the platforms make it, are, are sort of restraining, uh, you know, like network connectivity, bandwidth, horsepower, camera accuracy, GPS, accelerometer, compass accuracy? Like, what, what do you think holds back application development? Between other platforms, like comparing iPhone and Android? Well, I guess, yeah. The, relative to each other or relative to, or just in general, I mean, I figure, I consider them to be more or less equivalent to each other, but I may have a naive view. <laughs> in my opinion, um, you know, it's hardware, but one, one in 3GS is the only flavor of the iPhone that has copies right now, so you want stuff for 3GS. Um, and then I guess just, you know, what libraries are available to you, I mean, I know that a lot of people have expressed some pains with Apple and, and the ways that they've been a little bit restricted and what libraries are able to utilize across. Potentially we could do more if we could use that, uh, you know, real-time video library to get apps on the optical of that. So, but other than that, I mean, everything is available right now for, for to doing location-based stuff. I mean, everything that you saw here today from a location-based augmented reality perspective is possible. So, what do you think? You can always use a little more CPU. <laughs> but that, that's just because I'm lazy. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Sometime soon, submit uh, your company's info, products, and stuff on mobile. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.